One of the upcoming features in the Dublin release in ServiceNow is an updated JSON web service processor. While it is still not an official REST API for the platform, it's still an improvement on the original JSON processor that was released a few years ago. The original JSON web service was created to address some basic needs that a handful of customers were requesting in order to provide simple RESTful calls to interact with the ServiceNow platform. However, as people have used this, we found some serious performance issues and bulk data limitations that hindered this processor. Secondly, the original processor had some slight security issues that made it a security risk for some organizations just based on how they were using that processor. Finally, the JSON web service was inconsistent with how its counterparts worked, such as the XML web service and the SOAP web service. They were accessed in different ways with different URL parameters. Due to the underlying issues in the JSON web service plugin, ServiceNow rewrote the plugin from scratch and worked to get it more similar to the capabilities of their SOAP web service counterparts, as well as their CSV and XML processors for handling the bulk data. Starting with Dublin, ServiceNow will enable the JSON v2 plugin by default. They will also deprecate and essentially remove the original JSON web service plugin so that it cannot be added onto new instances without special request. Additionally, the processor is now being moved to the Java code base rather than using the JavaScript implementation that was used for the original web service processor. Rumor has it, the JSON v2 plugin will be made available for Calgary instances in the next published uh, release of the Calgary patch, probably coming in the late part of 2013. I highly recommend customers discontinue the use of the original JSON web service plugin and migrate those integrations to be compatible with the JSON v2 format. Luckily, not much has changed in the interface, so the effort should not be too monumental. The JSON v2 web service will be accessed by using the URL parameter JSON v2, all one word, with a lowercase v for the version. The JSON v2 web service can use either GET or POST requests for querying or deleting data. POST requests are required for creating or modifying data through the web service. Like its predecessor, JSON v2 Web Service goes through a basic authentication layer for determining a client's access to the resources before being referenced. Also, a content type header is now required on all requests. This will be important and pretty easy to implement as you migrate the old JSON Web Service clients over to the new JSON v2. Now let's talk about some of the basics of using the JSON v2 Web Service. You'll find a lot of similarities between this and the JSON web service, as I previously mentioned. The first step is to set up the base URL. Now, in order to access a table's resources through JSON v2, you must reference the table URL that you're going to work with. In ServiceNow, you can access a table resource by appending its database name to the end of the URL and then adding a .do extension. For example, the incident table in ServiceNow has a database name of incident, all lowercase. You would form the URL in this manner. You would go https colon forward slash forward slash and then your instance prefix dot service hyphen now dot com forward slash and this is where we put the table name incident dot do. Next, to trigger the JSON v2 processor, we're going to need to add the JSON v2 parameter. This is as simple as adding capital JSON, lowercase v, and number 2, or JSON v2 equals true. Either one of those strings would work. Add this to your URL. So if you were accessing the incident table, your URL might look like this. Next, we need to remember to set our content type header. This was not a requirement in the old JSON code. It is in the JSON v2 processor. Remember this header will need to be set, but it's always going to have the same value, at least at this present time. But you do need to include it. Your header string would look something like content type is application slash JSON. The next step is to set your desired action. Sysparm underscore action tells us what action we want to perform with this web service call. 
I like to do this in the URL, but some of the post functions allow you to set it in the body of the post. Since the get requires it in the URL, I'd like to provide it in the URL for all the functions. But you can do the following actions with this web service. Uh, look at the official documentation for definitions on what these actions do. But you can do a get, a get keys, get records, insert, insert multiple, update, delete record, and delete multiple. If we wanted to do a get records call, we would set up our sysparm underscore action parameter in the following way. We're now going to add any additional URL parameters uh, as needed, depending on what we want to do. You may want to use some of these URL parameters. These are some of the most commonly used ones uh, by me. Uh, display value. This will be true or false. It determines whether or not you want display values shown instead of sysids for all the reference fields. Sysparm underscore view allows you to specify a view name on the table, and that will limit the fields that are shown uh, in, the, in the response uh, when you're using get records. Uh, it'll limit those fields to the fields that are shown on that particular view. Sysparm query uses an encoded query to filter the records. It might be a, a query similar to what you might use with your Glide Record API. This will be used with get keys, get records, and delete multiple when you're filtering the data. Sysparm underscore record underscore count limits the number of records that are returned. This is only used with get records, but you can specify to, to return just five records, 10 records, 100 records, etc. This is often handy to be used when you're trying to chunk or page the data in a large response. Sysparm underscore sys underscore ID is used with the get or delete record functions. This is where you can specify the exact sys ID of the record that you want to get or delete. Now we're going to add body content. Now this is only for the post functions, but uh, all body content at this time is in the JSON format. You'll use this for insert, insert multiple, or an update. For more information on this format, see the wiki documentation for some examples. Now to put all this in practice, we're going to do an example of making a query to the incident table in an instance. Since we may have more incident records than are allowed, we're going to limit the number of returned records and chunk the results. Also, we don't care a lot of we don't care about a lot of the fields, so we're only going to require the fields that are used in the mobile view, and we only want those to be returned through the web service calls. Finally, we will request display values rather than sysids for reference fields. So let's follow the steps that we've already outlined to start to generate our first RESTful request. First of all, we're going to set up the URL to operate against the incident table within our instance. Next, we're going to create a URL parameter that invokes the JSON v2 processor. Step three, we're going to set the content type to be application JSON. Next, we're going to use the get records action in this web service call. We'll also use some optional parameters to get what we want for the display variables. So for the display variables, we'll add the display value parameter and make that true. To restrict the number of fields to just use those of the mobile view, we use the sysparm view parameter. And in order to page and chunk the data, we want to order the results by sysid so that we can page to them accurately. So we'll do a sysparm query of order by sysid. Then we need to page the data into manageable sets. For this example, we'll say three records per query. It's really low, but heck, this is just a demo. So to do that, we're going to do sysparm underscore record underscore count equals three. Now, when we submit this request, we're going to get a response. That response will have three records. If we look at the last record, notice that these records do go uh, with the sysids in order, starting from the lowest order and going to the highest. 
So since we want to page to the next set of records, we'll want to copy this sysid on the last record. Now we're going to modify our sysparm query. We want it to still order by sysid, but we want to only get those records whose sysid is greater than the last sysid that was returned in our set. And if we do this and submit that request, that's going to get us the next set of three records.